Hello, mystery and thriller fans, and welcome to episode two of Patricia Broderick's Cozy Dead on My Feet. I'm Jess, and this is Cam Cat Unwrapped. Previously on Dead on My Feet, the news that shoe magnate Milo was found with a sliver of ivory jammed in his throat raises the question, was he tangled up with a brutal cartel that traffics endangered wildlife? Kate, a former B-movie actress, hires Nellie to write her memoir and enjoys sharing nuggets of information about Milo, her former lover, but only to a point. But Kate does tell her, follow the ivory, an elephant never forgets. Chapter 5 Social media was having a field day speculating about Milo's mysterious demise. The mainstream media had mostly stuck to the facts they had, saying that the designer had died under suspicious circumstances and details would be forthcoming pending an autopsy. But the popular websites had been sharing tantalizing tidbits, absent of any credible sources. Some said a drunken Milo had fallen overboard following his glittering yacht party. Others that he had jumped over the rail in a fit of despair. And yet others claimed that perhaps a jealous husband might have given old Milo a little push. But none of them had mentioned anything about a chunk of ivory shoved down Milo's throat. Or the fact that he had been fitted with a pair of cement designer booties. That gave our gang a little time to poke around, and we had at least two advantages over everyone else. Dame C and Detective Nakamura. At least for now. Then Scylla, my crier colleague and lifelong buddy, came up with a plan. From experience, I knew this would be either brilliant or bonkers. Mitzi and Milt Morrison are hosting a fundraiser for Save the Shore, Supposedly, a drive to clean up the beach. But if you want my opinion, it's really a slush fund to pay for their various NIMBY crusades. But you didn't hear that from me, Nellie. With Scylla, I knew that I had to be patient and that she'd eventually get to the point. On this day, we were taking a break out back on the deck of the crier and sharing a jar of sun tea she had brewed. A few feet away, tucked into his hammock, Hung between two aging palm trees, Captain Jack was sleeping off his lunch, his snores punctuating our conversation. Anyway, I'll be attending, of course, but you can bet that this not-in-my-backyard crowd will have a lot more on their minds than shoveling sand. Milo will be the topic du jour. I took a sip and watched as Scylla poured herself another glass. I was getting antsy, and in a few minutes, I had to return to the deadbeat. You're burying the lead, so what does this have to do with me? She made a face, the one that said, I'm getting there. What if you and Finn crash the party? She said finally, crash? Yeah, you know, go undercover. Pretend that you're part of the wait staff. You carry those little trays of canopies, and Finn hands out the bubbly. No one pays you any attention, so you get to sop up all the gossip about Milo. Brilliant, am I right? Where to start? First of all, how are we supposed to infiltrate the help? I'm assuming the caterers know who they hired. Supplied them with uniforms, stuff like that. She flapped her hand. They'll be too busy tending to the caviar crudités and crustaceans to notice who's doing the actual serving, as long as everyone's getting fed and watered. As for the uniforms, they always keep a few spares tucked away in the kitchen. No problem. How do you know all this, Scylla? She gave me her megawatt grin. I know, because that's how I got this gig, Nellie. Captain Jack told me I'd get the society slot if I delivered a big juicy scoop. 
you know I've always been resourceful. So I sprang into action, found a bash to crash, slipped in, and voila. Before anyone even noticed, I was suited up and working the crowd. You wouldn't believe the dirt they dished. Nobody paid any attention to me. Of course, I had to drab down, not easy for me to do, but it was worth it. None of this should have surprised me, knowing Scylla, who used to supplement her allowance by liberating items from her favorite stores. She never got caught. So you delivered a nice, big, juicy scoop to Jack and got the job? Scylla frowned. Well, as it turned out, Jack didn't really care anything about who was getting a facelift or who was insider trading. He likes to keep the society folks happy so they buy ads and pay for those obits. But he admired my pluck. That's the word he used. Pluck. Also, I was able to smuggle out a basket of gourmet goodies and some primo booze. So Captain Jack was happy as a clam. I stared into my sun tea as though it would infuse me with wisdom. But no such luck. Getting back to your plan, Syl, why are you so sure that nobody at the party would recognize us? She gave me a pitiful look. How could I be so dense? No offense, Nelly, but you're not on TV anymore. And that was back east. A small market, too. The obits don't carry a byline or your photo, unlike partying with Priscilla. Not to brag about my column. It's not like you make the rounds of mortuaries and crematoriums to do your job. So even those rich undertakers wouldn't notice you. Point taken. Okay, that's true for me, but what about Finn? He covers the town council meetings, which are presided over by the very same rich dudes and dames that attend those parties. And as you well know, Finn has been a thorn in their patrician posterior since he arrived in town. Are you telling me that he could stroll into the kitchen, swipe a uniform and parade around with a tray full of champagne flutes and not be recognized? Is he supposed to don a Groucho Marx disguise? Scylla thought about that staring into her glass, but her sun tea didn't seem to offer any more enlightenment than mine. Then she brightened, and I was almost certain that a virtual light bulb had switched on. How about this, then? Finn loves to gamble. Five-card stud, Texas hold'em, strip poker, not so sure. Anyway, most of these soirees have a game going on in some smoke-filled room, usually the man cave, you know, with lots of leather furniture and framed fish and dead things with antlers. That would be his ticket. Imagine what he might hear at one of those tables. Deep breath. Why would they invite Finn? He's been a pain. I roll. I know, I know, in their patrician posteriors. That's the point, Nelly. Don't you see? They hate Finn so they would love to fleece him and send him home naked in a barrel. Scylla paused and seemed to be conjuring this image. But if Finn has a reputation as a card sharp, then I say that, Nellie. What I said was Finn loves to play poker, but he plays it with his pals at the pub, including Captain Jack. Those guys and gals are fishermen and waitresses and landscapers. You know, the help. So... The society folks wouldn't be wise to how well Finn plays. But, Syl, you'd still have to get him invited, right? Her violet eyes sparkled. No problem there. Milt, who's hosting this nimby party with Mitzi, is kinda sweet on me. She shrugged as if to say, need I even say? No, she needn't say. He's also a serious gambler. Scylla leaned in and lowered her voice. I know all about that. The debts, the collectors coming around, scary stuff. No broken kneecaps that I know of, but still. Anyway, all I've got to do is ring him up and say, Hi, Milty, it's Scylla. A favor? Could my pal Finn O'Connor come to the party and play a few hands with you and the gang? She had placed her cell phone up to her ear to paint the picture. She even paused as though she were waiting for Milty's response. He can? <laughs> You're the best. Another pause. I should tell you, Milty, poor Finn loves to play, but he's really not very good and has lost a pile. 
I hate to encourage him, but you know, he asked me to put in a word. How could I say no? Scylla then signed off and placed her cell on the table. Me see, Nellie? Easy peasy. He's in like Finn. I vaguely remembered that the phrase was in like Flynn and had something to do with an old Hollywood scandal involving swashbuckler Errol Flynn. My mother was a vintage film buff, and she stuffed my young head with lots of movie trivia. Not always helpful. And why would these high rollers be dishing the dirt in front of Finn? Even if he's not wearing a fedora with a press card tucked in the band, they know he's a reporter. Scylla gave me another eye roll. Do you know how hammered those guys get? Their man cave should have bourbon stalactites hanging from the ceiling. I don't know how they keep their cards straight. And you know this how? Scylla gave me another shrug. I might have sat in on a hand or two. I started to wonder how much she knew about strip poker and how much I knew about my friend, but I let both pass. It was time to get back to work. Okay, Syl, I'll run all this by Finn, but I can't promise anything. Finn's in. Captain Jack snorted, swung his stubby legs over the hammock and jumped down to the deck. Uh, how do you, I sputtered. Who can snooze with you two magpies flapping your beaks? Anyway, it's a damn fine plan. And I know Finn. He'll love it. He will? I asked. But Jack was already stomping across the deck to the back door, tossing off his parting line. scylla has got a good nose for news, Nellie. Scruples are optional. I like that. Plus, she's got... I know. Pluck. Chapter 6 Captain Jack was right about Finn. He was all in, so to speak, about his turn as a gullible gambler, just ripe to be plucked. But he did have one question. Please tell me I don't have to wear a tux. I'd seldom seen the guy in anything but cargo pants, jeans, and t-shirts. A polo was about as fancy as he got. Scylla sighed. Would that be a deal breaker? This time Scylla had joined our confab at Starbucks, seated at our usual table out on the deck, under the twinkly lights, as the sun set and the sky shimmered in shades of pink and orange. Finn scooped the whipped cream off his frappuccino with the edge of the lid, licking it off. Guess I'll have to take one for the team. He then tossed the lid into the trash, frisbee style. Are we all set to go, Syl? Melty was all for it. Knowing him, he's already sized you up for a sucker and plans to relieve you of everything you've got, including your skivvies. Let's leave my skivvies out of this. Finn grinned. You want me to do the hustler bit? Ask them if an ace is higher than a king. What are those little shovels on the cards called? Like that? Or do I do what I do best? What's that, Finian? I asked. Win, of course. Scylla mulled that one over. Just read the room and follow your gut, I guess. We've all got our parts to play. The goal is to dig up as much dirt as we can about Milo. You really think someone at the party knows who killed him? I bit into a dark chocolate peanut butter cup. Drunk or not, is anyone likely to be gossiping about the cartel after what happened to Milo? Scylla shrugged. Nellie, these folks are not like us. Who knows how they think? Besides, we don't know for sure there's a cartel lurking around, do we? Maybe he was into something else. Finn wiped a dollop of cream off his chin. Wendy thinks so, even if she was only speaking hypothetically. I figure the feds are probably all over this investigation, maybe with a little help from the local cops. Wendy does not like to be upstaged by anyone, and that's why she's willing to trade intel with us. She wants to crack this and get the glory. When he said glory, I was thinking gory. What if gangsters are involved in Milo's death? I've been reading up on smugglers, and they are serious sickos. Scylla looked surprised. Nellie, are you having second thoughts about this? Scylla had been to Mitzi and Milty's McMansion before and knew the layout of the kitchen, pantry, and mudroom where the caterer stowed the fresh uniforms. Smooth as she was, 
Scylla had my part all figured out. She'd get there early with a hostess gift, and while the Morrisons were getting ready, wander out to the kitchen, chat up the waitstaff. While they bustled around, she'd saunter over to the back door and open it for a breath of fresh air, while I'd slip into the mudroom and get suited up. Easy peasy, as Scylla was fond of saying. But since we had hatched our undercover plot, a flock of butterflies had taken up residence in my tummy. Did you know that these monsters dismember people? I asked. Scylla and Finn gawked at me. Are you just finding out that cartels do bad things, Nell? How long have you been a reporter? Finn asked. I know, I've read the stories, seen the movies, but I never covered any of that stuff. Now it seems awfully close to home. No one spoke for a while. Finn slugged down his drink, Scylla sipped her latte, and I nibbled my chocolate, hoping that it would calm my nerves. We don't have much time now, Finn said. It would be nice to have something to report before we go to press. The party's tomorrow night. Among the three of us, we should be able to come up with something by Monday. Besides, as much as I hate to admit it, Scylla added, we're small potatoes, Nelly. Nobody is going to be worrying about us. Sure. And up to now, I'd been nothing but a half-baked potato to boot, despite my best efforts. What was the worst that could happen? I didn't really need to ask because the answer was clear. Who was I kidding? Milo had not put on his cement booties willingly. But I was in my prime. And if I was ever going to make it as a journalist, this was the time. Maybe I could embroider that ditty on a pillow. I took a deep breath and nodded. Then we all bumped fists. My mother would be proud. Okay, then. Any questions? Scylla asked. Yeah. Finn wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Where do I rent a tux and who's going to pay for it? Once again, I found myself wondering about Finian O'Connor. Who was he? Where did he come from? And why, if he was such a hotshot, at least locally, was he spinning his wheels at a minor league community newspaper, even in the rarefied realm of La Jolla? Captain Jack must have known the answers to these questions because he had hired him. But Scylla and I didn't have a clue. Not for lack of trying. Scylla was especially good at drawing people out. But even she got only vague answers when she asked Finn about his background. So, Finn, where are you from? Shrug. Here and there, I've moved around a lot. Where did you work before? Steely stare. I freelanced. I like being my own boss. But Captain Jack's your boss now, Finn. Why? Stands up, grabs his notebook, and heads to the door. Gotta go, Sil. See ya. If Jack wanted to enlighten us, he would have. But he didn't. So neither of us bothered to ask. Finn had been on the job before either of us had arrived, but not by much. He probably was a rolling stone who freelanced stories while he was on the road. Maybe Finn had run into hard times and needed a steady source of income. Gambling debts, maybe? A past he was trying to escape? Or maybe this whole Milo melodrama had made me suspicious of everything and everybody. Maybe a cigar was just a cigar. That night, our tuxedoed ace reporter was seated at the card table in a back room of Milt Morrison's place as expensive cigar smoke rose into the air. I knew this because Scylla, who wasn't undercover and was actually working her beat, had poked her well-coiffed head into the room, chirping, Hi, guys. Who's winning? In addition to Finn and Milt, the other poker players were the usual assortment of wealthy white males with money to lose, and that's what most of them were probably doing, at least from what Scylla had observed. I watched her click-clacking her stilettos over the highly polished floor, waving and air-kissing her way to the invisible weight person, me, carrying a tray of exotic nipples. Finn's in the chips, and the other gents do not look happy. Scylla whispered as she plucked a caviar-encrusted cracker from my tray. You can bet, so to speak, that they're not too happy with Milty for inviting him. Of course, the big question was what, if anything, Finn was finding out about Milo. 
but that intel would have to wait until after the party was over. I'd only been on the job for an hour, and my feet were killing me, even with sensible shoes. How did Scylla manage to glide through the evening as though she were walking on a cloud? I looked down at Scylla's feet. Are those Milo's shoes? Looking around the crowd, beaming that megawatt smile, Scylla nodded. Kate lent me a pair. She whispered, I'm hoping there'll be a conversation piece, you know? Get someone talking about Milo? Her smile turned into a wince. They're a little tight, but I'm working through the pain. Tomorrow, I'll need bed rest. A voice from across the room ended my briefing. Scylla, come here, there's someone you must meet. My pal squinted across the room and waved, whispering to me. Mitzi wants some ink for her new best friend, who, no doubt, just cut a huge check for the NIMBY fund. I mean the save our shore stash. Well, I better get my phone out for a glam society pick. Good luck with the recon. What I needed at that point, besides a nice warm foot bath, was the loo. So I returned my platter to the kitchen. So far, I hadn't collected any relevant intel about Milo. In fact, from what I had overheard, the guests were as curious about his demise as we were. And some of them wondered who would likely inherit the rich bachelor slash playboy's empire. Good question. I'd file that away for later. In the meantime, it was time to do some snooping. And being an invisible weight person, how hard could that be? Plus, I really needed to pee. The help's bathroom was in the mudroom. Better that we don't muck up the posh lounge, which Scylla told me was located upstairs at the end of the hall. All I needed to do was act as though I had a perfectly good reason to go upstairs. Sort of like carrying a clipboard when you case a neighborhood. I glanced around, and no one seemed to be watching me so I sauntered over to the majestic staircase and started wending my way up the marble steps on sore feet and a full bladder. On the landing, I looked up and down the hall. All was quiet, although you never knew what was going on beyond closed doors. I kept walking until I spotted a door with a sign that read Mesdames, so this had to be the place. Maybe the Monsieur's Lou was at the other end of the hall. It occurred to me that the Morrison's home might be a renovated boutique hotel, given the commercial restrooms. I went into the gilded lounge, which was bathed in the sort of soft lighting that every fitting room should use. Potpourri scented the air, and flickering LED lights accented the vanity tables. Elegant chairs covered in rose-colored velvet were arranged in one corner. All that was missing was a crystal chandelier. I heard a flush and quickly ducked into one of the stalls, listening as a pair of heels clicked across the marble floor. A faucet turned on and then off, then a few minutes of primping, no doubt, and finally the sound of a door, opening and closing. I peeked out, listened, and then exited, tiptoeing down the short row of stalls, looking for any telltale shoes, Milo's or not. I was alone. So I did my business, wiping myself with toilet paper so soft I could have draped it over my shoulders as a shawl. Nothing to see here. So I left, and keeping an eye on the staircase started to explore, pausing at each door and listening. Do I dare peek inside and risk finding a couple in flagrante delecto? Why was I using fancy words? This place was getting to me. Anyway, I didn't have to make that decision because at the other end of the hall, not far from Monsieur's, a door was open, revealing a sitting room. Who else but the rich needed a special room for sitting? I took another look down the hall and, coast clear, went inside. Fortunately, I didn't need to turn on the light as there were sconces on the walls, bathing the room in a cozy glow. How compromising could an unlocked room be? What did I think I'd find? A noose, a wrench, a candlestick? Colonel Mustard and Miss Peacock lounging around? Maybe an elephant tusk displayed on the mantel. I stood in the center of the room and turned around in a circle, taking everything in. The finely crafted furniture, the oriental rugs, and the framed art and photography displayed on the fleur-de-lis papered walls. Hello. 
Standing out among the artsy fair was something that did not seem to fit. A plainly framed, boldly colored caricature. A couple dressed in safari clothes, complete with pith helmets, astride a huge elephant, its tusks curled, the eyes the sort that would follow you around the room. The riders, I knew, were Mitzi and Melty Morrison. Are you fond of street art? Now I knew what it was like to jump out of my skin. I whirled around to find the gracious hostess standing in the doorway, looking bemused. I realized that my mouth was open, but no words were coming out. Then I collected myself and went into my default mode, babbling. Oh, Mrs. Morrison, I'm so sorry. I was looking for a restroom. The one in the mudroom was occupied, and I really needed to... Well, anyway, I turned the wrong way and found the men's room, messieurs, and then I noticed this room, and it looked so inviting with those cool lights and everything, so I... I didn't know this woman, but it didn't take me long to size her up as a snob and a bully who was enjoying my discomfort. Oh, no need to apologize, miss. Oh, crap. The gang of three had gone over everything but my alias if something went south, like it was going now. But I was quick on my feet, as sore as they were. Uh, Cochrane, Elizabeth, Lizzie. This was the real name of Nellie Bly, so technically I wasn't lying, right? Well, Lizzie, no harm done. Mitzi strolled into the room, tall and willowy. Probably late middle age, but could have been older. With these folks, you never knew. She wore an emerald green ankle-length gown and matching shoes, Silk or satin, I couldn't tell. Her jewels sparkled in the dim light, and her auburn hair was swept back in a chignon. Classy. Standing next to me, she pointed at the caricature and began to regale me about its provenance, as though she were a doyen at one of the museums in town. My husband, Milton, and I are friends of the zoo. We had this drawn during one of its fundraisers. I take it you weren't really posing on an elephant. He sure looks real. When I'm in uncomfortable situations, making stupid remarks is right up there with my tendency to babble. But Mitzi just smiled. No, Lizzie, Kabwa is very real, and will be the new star draw at the zoo, no doubt. And no, we weren't actually astride him. Her thought balloon read, you moron. Interesting name, does he live at the zoo? Oh yes, he's a new resident. Milton and I were among those who helped facilitate his transfer from Africa. But they're endangered, you know. So it was a privilege to have played a role in providing him with a safe environment where he can thrive. He's sure a big one, at least from the picture. Kabwa is seven and a half tons, hence his name. Kabwa is Swahili for giant. Then, just as quickly as she had arrived, Mitzi turned on her stilettos and sashayed to the door. Don't be long, Lizzie. We have a full house tonight, so it's all hands on deck. Then she glided out, leaving me to ponder my next move. When I returned to the party, a makeshift dais had been installed next to a set of purple velvet curtains. I had restocked my tray and was painfully plodding around the partygoers who plucked pâté and petty fours from me without so much as a thanks. How are those feet doing? Then Mitzi strode through the crowd, which parted like the Red Sea, stepped onto the dais and raised her arms. Silence descended and she announced, People, it's time for the auction. Please deposit your written bids on the items that you desire. With that, Mitzi and one of her minions tugged on gold tassels on the sides of the curtains, which opened to reveal a long table draped in matching purple velvet. A dazzling array of goods, designer clothing, bags and shoes, jewelry that sparkled under the track lighting, and I spotted a few pieces that looked like ivory. There were intricately carved urns and vases, framed oil paintings, and so much more, all awaiting new ownership. This was not your granny's garage sale. Wow, I was dazzled. The partygoers were transformed into a pack of hyenas let loose on prey, and I had to dodge and weave through the crowd while holding my tray of canopies over my head. Scylla came to my rescue and guided me into an alcove out of the fray. 
what the hell is this, Syl? Where did all this stuff come from? Well, while you were snooping around upstairs, an armored car arrived and trucked all these goodies in. They're being auctioned with the proceeds going to SOS. Mitzi's been trolling for donations all year. She's really good at it. I stared at the scene before me. All the lords and ladies pawing over the booty and slapping their bids down hither and thither. My mom would have compared it to a sale in Feline's basement, where feverish shoppers would enter into mortal combat for an off-the-rack rayon blouse. All this stuff was donated by this crowd? Are they regifting? Scylla gave me one of her looks. No, Nellie, that's not how this works, at least not for Mitzi and Milty. Once a year, they hold one of these soirees, and the silent auction is the big draw. Everyone wants an invite, so they spend a lot of time sucking up to them to snag one. Scylla pointed to the luxury-laden table and lowered her voice. Those items are exclusive, and money contributed by the wealthy grovelers is what pays for them. They can't get these things themselves. You're not going to find them at the mall. I tell you, Nellie, those two are well-connected. I'd love to know more about their supply chain. My feet were throbbing. How long is this shindig going on? If the auction is the highlight, can we split when it's over? Scylla cast a look toward the back of the house. Well, that would depend on Finn. He's still in there, but I didn't want to poke my head in too many times. I gotta tell you, Nellie, these poker games can go on into the wee hours. Wonderful. Finn has been sitting on his butt all night, guzzling expensive booze and probably has won enough of the pot to retire. Me, I'm hungry, tired, and can no longer feel my feet. What do we have to show for it? Scylla tugged me closer and again lowered her voice. I have a few nuggets, and I'll bet you collected a few upstairs, even if you don't know it. Finn's a great reporter, so I'm sure he's got some good stuff too. I think we should get together tomorrow and compare notes. I'll ask Finn to invite Wendy. Maybe she's off on Sunday. We can meet for breakfast. No, I am planning to sleep late and then take a long soak in the tub. Okay, fine. How about brunch then? Meanwhile, you hold down the fort here and I'll go check on Finn and the boys. As she teetered off, I sank farther into the shadows of the alcove and stuffed a petty four into my mouth. Milo, what have you gotten us into? That's when the lights went out, followed at first by surprised murmurs, and then an overpowering stench that sent the revelers gasping and running for the exits. It sounded like a herd of elephants, which seemed to be the theme of the evening. In the crunch, a few cell phone lights came on, and I could hear Mitzi moaning across the room. Well, I was the help, right? So I might as well help. Although the air was so foul, I was feeling dizzy. I felt for a napkin from the buffet table and covered my nose and mouth, which only made breathing harder. What to do? My choices were to get trampled trying to get out the door, or having to face whatever had happened to Mitzi. Nelly! Suddenly, Scylla had appeared by my side and was tugging at my arm. I think Mitzi's been hurt. Let's try to help. Yeah, my thoughts exactly. Scylla dragged me along in the dark, dodging panicky partiers and maneuvering around the auction table where we found Mitzi, curled in a fetal position, moaning and gasping. Milton! She shrieked. Where are you? Get your ass over here! Scylla sunk down on her knees and flashed her cell phone light in Mitzi's face. What are you doing? Mitzi shrieked, knocking the phone out of Scylla's hand. Help me get up, damn it! The fresh night air was mercifully drifting through the now open door, and the stink was starting to dissipate. Then the lights came back on. Mitzi was sitting up, her legs spread in a most unladylike fashion, one of her beautifully pedicured feet bare, her face a canvas of smudged makeup and drool. Then she resumed her shrieking, her eyes bulging, hyperventilating while pointing at the table, where only moments ago had laid an array of dazzling treasures. They're gone! Somebody call 911 this instant! Then she passed out. Chapter 7 
creatures of habit, and for most of us possessed of a limited budget, we skipped the posh brunch bistros in the village for Starbucks. The sausage egg muffin and other breakfast fare were still warm and edible at 11 o'clock, and we washed everything down with our favorite beverages. Topic, of course, was the Morrison's misbegotten party of the previous evening. While the ritzy revelers had stampeded out the door not long after the lights went out and the bedlam started, Finn, Scylla, and I had hung around to get as much intel as we could, despite the stench that was still heavy in the air. Somebody had called 911, and once the cops arrived, Mitzi was awake, but not very lucid. While Milt ministered to her, the two officers, who looked like rookies who got stuck with the night shift, turned their attention to us. When they realized that none of us had anything relevant to contribute, we were sprung. Wendy had agreed to join us for brunch and had come armed with a few tidbits that had not been reported by the media. At least those who actually cared about a NIMBY fund gala hosted by the venal and vacuous luminaries of the village. The security they hired for the party wasn't exactly from Blackwater. Wendy told us, inhaling the aroma of her coffee, they were rent cops who were found tied up and stuffed in an upstairs closet. Wow, I didn't hear about that. Scylla said, that's because Madame Morrison didn't let anyone know. Wendy said, she told the cops who showed up that her hired guns must have run out the back door. Why? I asked. Apparently, the Morrisons didn't want any of their circle to know they were stupid enough to hire a couple of beach bums on the cheap to guard a table filled with valuables worth a gazillion bucks. They weren't sure, right? Finn asked, his notebook out and pen in hand. Wendy shrugged. Not my turf, but I'd say yes. The folks who donated that stuff will want a full accounting, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, the loot is probably long gone by now. Scylla sighed. Poor Mitzi. She must have been terrified. Can you imagine being knocked down and pinned against the floor while thieves get away with a fortune? That part had made the news. Among the scant details, it was reported that the stench had been caused by a stink bomb, but not much else was known about the brazen home invasion at the Morrison Manse. Am I wrong, or is this posh little village suffering from a crime wave? I asked. I know I'm not in Kansas anymore, but is this normal? No, it isn't. Wendy said. Finn pointed his pen in her direction. So, do you think there's a connection with Milo? That question tickled my memory banks. You know, I was looking at the jewelry, and a few of the pieces sure looked like ivory to me. Not that I'm an aficionado. Again, Wendy shrugged. Could be. Too early to tell. Then it was time for more show and tell. Scylla retrieved a pink leather journal from her shoulder bag. I jotted down a few notes after I got back, she said, wiping away crumbs from a mini vanilla scone with a napkin. The chit-chat last night was just gossip about Milo, but nobody I talked to or overheard seemed to have a clue about what happened to him. What about his business ties? Wendy asked. Well, the funny thing about Milo is even though he loved to hobnob and party, no one was actually close to him. At least, that's the impression I got. Lots of acquaintances and hangers-on and hotties, but no real friends. What about those girlfriends? Finn wanted to know. With all that dough, you figure he'd have a bunch of trophies tucked away. That's the point, Finn. He had lots of supermodels and starlets and society babes competing for his attention, but they never lasted long. But getting back to the party, what I found interesting was the auction. It's the first one I've been to since I hit town, but there was something shady about the armored car that delivered all the swag. I held up my palm. Wait a minute, Scylla. You saw the stuff being delivered? Isn't that what I just said, Nellie? I just happened to have slipped out the front door to have a smoke. A, a smoke? You don't smoke. Scylla rolled her eyes. Well, they don't know that, do they, Nellie? I always keep a pack of ciggies in my purse. You never know when a prop will come in handy like last night. 
Anyway, I stood in the shadows holding my fake Virginia Slim, and I watched the delivery guys hauling the stuff out the back of the truck. They were all dressed in black uniforms and caps. Nobody spoke, but they moved like they were on some kind of military mission. Black ops, maybe. Finn stopped scribbling. What do you know about black ops, Scylla? You cover high society. Scylla gave him a sly smile. Wouldn't you like to know? Wendy pointed at Scylla. I've been meaning to ask you, why weren't you covering Milo's yacht party? Didn't you get an invite? Scylla nodded. Of course I did. But there are a lot of parties going on right now, and I had a prior commitment. One where nobody died. She looked a bit disappointed. If only, right? Anyway, about last night. I don't think anybody noticed me, so I took a few shots of the crew. And the armored car. With that, Scylla picked up her phone and called up the pictures she'd taken. We passed the phone around, and I had to admit the crew looked a bit sinister. But what did I know? Okay, so these guys do look a little shady compared to, say, Brinks or Dunbar. But is that all you got? She gave me that look again. Did any of you notice what's missing on the truck? Wendy held out her hand and I deposited the phone in her palm. She stared at the image for a few seconds and then nodded. No license plates, for one thing. Did you notice if there were any logos? Scylla shook her head. It was dark, but the lights at the entrance gave me a clear view. When I slipped out after they arrived, I checked out the front and the other side of the truck while they were busy unloading, and there wasn't any logo or ID anywhere. No front license plate either. Scylla took a breath, but I did get some shots of the auction table. Under the radar, of course. She said with a wink, Unfortunately, my uniform had no pockets, so I'd had no place to stow a cell phone and take photos. Good for Scylla. Any idea where the Morrisons got all the merch? Wendy asked. Scylla filled her in about Mitzi's genius at raking in donations and her refusal to ever divulge her donor list. I used to think Mitzi kept her donors shrouded in a cloud of secrecy because she didn't want any competition, but now I'm not so sure. Scylla said, Wendy continued scrolling through the photos. Last time we all met, I gave you an overview of the illegal poaching of endangered animals and how tough it is to nail these cartels that are smuggling animal parts for goods and medicine. It goes beyond elephants, Nellie. We're not only talking about pachyderms and rhinos and big cats, but there's a huge trade in sea turtles, crocodiles, even snakes, especially pythons. Pythons? I asked, feeling my chest tighten. I can tell you that about a half million python skins are exported every year from Southeast Asia, bringing in one billion. A big incentive. At that rate, how long do you figure this species will survive? Nobody responded, but the answer was clear. But it's not only pythons, and it's not only about snake skins. There's a market for rattlesnake venom, and there are plenty of gullible or desperate folks out there who consider this a wonder drug. In fact, it can kill them. You're saying that it's illegal to mess with rattlesnakes? Finn asked. I'll give you an example, Wendy said. In Arizona, rattlesnakes are considered the property of the state, so trying to sell them or milk them is illegal. Now, let's talk about those sea turtles. Their shells are prized for jewelry and high-priced knickknacks. The problem is, the average consumer often has no idea that she's buying a necklace or earrings that are made from endangered creatures. Not all the boutiques who sell this stuff know either, but you can be sure that some of them do look the other way. They are complicit. We all let that sink in. I guess you can't tell anything about the items from just looking at my pics, right? No, but I'll need you to send those shots to me. All of them, Scylla, and I'll see what I can dig up. This may be the break we need to connect the dots to the smugglers. Then it was my turn. 
and I told everyone about my chat with Mitzi and her joyride on Cubwa the Elephant. But what did that prove? Sure, she and Milt had connections, and the money and clout to relocate a valuable animal from Africa. But did they break any laws? I mean, he still had his tusks. Finn was up next. He looked beat and was nursing a venti cup of what looked like strong black coffee, no frills and no food. He kept his sunglasses on, no doubt covering a set of bloodshot eyes, and rubbed his hand over the dark stubble on his jaw. Well, Finn, how much did you rake in before the lights went out? I asked. He peered at me over the rims of his glasses and took another sip of the bitter brew. I was beating the fancy pants off of them. But if I didn't slow down, I'd still be there. He said, those pricks hate to lose. It's not only about the money for that bunch. How much did you lose, Finn? Scylla looked worried. He shrugged. I broke even, and that seemed to satisfy them. So, no dirt about Milo? Wendy asked. What a waste of time. But you get points for trying. Finn removed his sunglasses and rubbed his eyes, and I could tell that he had a hell of a hangover. Oh, it wasn't a waste, Wendy. I was just saving the best for last. These guys, they're all alpha pricks, and that means they not only have to win, but they can drink anybody under the table. He said, taking a gulp from his cup. They get suspicious if a player doesn't match them shot for shot, you know. He shrugged. Again, rubbed his eyes and replaced his sunglasses. Anyway, John Jeffers was sitting in. John Jeffers? I asked. I quoted him in our first story. He said that Milo seemed fine at the yacht party. Dame C had also called Jeffers a fool. Finn waved his hand. Yeah, well, after a few belts, JJ. JJ? Jeffers, Nell. He tells us that old Milo was acting strange, moody, and not the usual life of the party. He spent most of the time down below. Get this, he even left his date for the night, a Victoria's Secret model, I think. He left her high and dry on deck. Jeffers said she got so mad that she went below and he could hear her pounding on the door to the cabin. So he goes to the top of the steps and watches her hammering the door with one of her stilettos. A Milo original, no less, he says, and she's yelling, Milo, Milo, and a bunch of X-rated words. She was swigging from a bottle of Cristal, so I guess he left her high, but not dry. You think she was planning on christening him? I asked. We all exchanged a glance. Was I joking about that? Good question. So we all turned to Wendy, who maintained her poker face. Okay, Wendy. I ventured, we've been sharing, but you've only been educating us about the scourge of smuggling endangered animal parts. That's good to know, but we're trying to stay ahead of this story, and we need something quick. Tomorrow's our deadline, remember? Can you help us connect the dots, at least a little? Who exactly are we dealing with? The theft at the Morrisons right under Mitzi's nose would be a good place to start. Wendy just sipped her chai tea. Come on, Wendy, Scylla said, smiling that smile. We know that Milo had a piece of ivory shoved down his throat and had cement in his boots, even if you won't confirm it. Could he have been struck with the proverbial blunt object like a champagne bottle? Wendy took a deep breath. I know nothing about champagne bottles. Well, you do now. Finn's voice had an edge to it. Look, I'm in a tough spot here. The chief is planning a press conference next week, and I have no idea who will be there. The feds or some other agency. The DA? No arrests have been made. That I do know. But you can confirm or deny what we already know, Wendy? Finn said, that would be a start. Give us something to run with tomorrow. Wendy had been doodling a swirly thing on her notebook, but looking at it upside down, it didn't seem to be a code, just something to do with her hands. You don't think anyone will know it's me leaking this intel? She asked. Just because I work downtown doesn't mean that nobody's seen me meeting with you guys. I'm not the only surfer in the department, you know. 
I've been careful, but still. You want to make chief of detectives someday, Wendy? Finn asked, peering at her from behind his shades. Then play ball with us. That was the deal. We've given you some good leads. It's time to share. Wendy gave him a fierce look. I want more, Finn, if you expect me to stick my neck out. You want more, Wendy? Good, because I haven't finished. Jeffers told us that Milo's date made such a scene that everyone started milling around Jeffers, including, get this, Mitzi and Milt Morrison. So Mitzi brushes past Jeffers and goes below, grabs the model by the arm and twists the bottle out of her hand, and then, not so gently, shoves her up the steps. Well, Vicky, the Victoria's Secret babe, wasn't too happy about this. But Mitzi, being an alpha female, takes charge. She went to the cabin door, but it was locked, and all the windows to the cabin were shuttered. Not a peep from inside either, Jeffers says. Finn took a breath and another slug of coffee. Of course, what happens on the Muse, that's Milo's boat, stays on the Muse. Except last night when Jeffers decided to run his mouth. And I gotta tell you, Milt didn't seem too happy about Jeffers' loose lips. He kept glancing my way, as though he was the only one who remembered I was a reporter. So I tried to look shit-faced, which, as time went on, is precisely what I was. Anyway, Milt finally managed to shut Jeffers up. You know, hey, are we gambling or gabbing? Play your bleeping hand, like that. Finn fixed his gaze on Wendy. So, detective, what do you say? How about you throw us a bone? Or, in this case, a tusk. We all turned to Wendy, who seemed ready to surrender. Okay, I'll confirm what you know so far. She said, but that'll have to hold you for a while until I know what the blowback will be after you print this. I'm just happy you're not online. Scylla held her phone up. No, but I do keep my readers posted through Twitter and such, Wendy. The crier might be old school, but it does have one foot in the 21st century. Actually, Syl, you use that stuff for your society sh- stories. Finn said, we're still working on Captain Jack to acknowledge we're even in a new century. Wendy sighed. Okay, fine. But that's the deal. You can keep snooping, but I've got to keep a low profile until after the press conference. Then we'll regroup and go from there. Agreed? We all nodded. Works for us, Wendy. I said. But you know what would be really terrific? How about you get us a copy of the autopsy report? She looked at me with wide eyes and open mouth. You want me to leak an autopsy report? Are you crazy? I'm guessing that's what the press conference is going to be about. You'll just have to wait. Finn held up a hand. That's fine, Wendy. We won't get greedy. Well, not for another day or two. By then, we'll be hungry again. So maybe we'll find some more loose lips. Scylla chirped. Yeah, well... Don't expect me to be filling them with pate and petty fours, I said. I'm still recovering from last night. That's when my cell phone buzzed. A blocked number. I answered. Nellie, it's Kate. Come to the house immediately and tell no one. Then she was gone. Everyone was staring at me now. Wrong number? Scylla asked. I stood and stuffed my phone in my purse and took a last swig of my latte. Sorry, folks, but I've got to run. I guess the game was afoot. A very apt turn of phrase, considering. Chapter 8 It was early afternoon when I arrived back at my place, or I should say Dame C's place, I parked my Mustang in the 10-car garage, and when I emerged, there she stood, one hand on her hip, the other clutching a lethal-looking gardening tool, decked out in full pruning attire. It's about time. Follow me. Kate led me up the cobblestone pathway past my granny flat and up to a decorative wishing well that sported a quaint little bucket dangling from a rope. 
my nose wrinkled, and it wasn't from the salty air wafting off the coast. Not good. Do you smell that, Nellie? Kate had stopped abruptly. There is something dead down there. I know that smell. I scooted over to her and felt a chill run down my spine. That's a working well, Kate. I thought it was just for show. She glared at me. Of course it's a working well. Style should always have substance. And that's where I draw my water for the plants. I cranked the bucket into the well, and that's when I noticed that horrid odor. I yanked the bucket back up, and you can see for yourself what's in it. Did I want to do that? I was never a crime reporter, and I didn't much want to start now. But curiosity got the better of me. I walked over to the well, holding my breath, and peeked down into the bucket. The afternoon sunshine played off the surface of the water, which had a definite pinkish tinge. I walked back to Kate. Okay, I see what you mean, but maybe an animal fell into the well. I had a terrible thought and started over to my cottage, but Kate grabbed me by the arm. Your cats are fine, Nellie, I checked. Those worthless felines are napping, as usual. And why would some feral creature wander into my yard, bleeding and fall into my well? It makes no sense. I thought about that. Kate, we don't even know if that's blood. Maybe it's rust. Another glare. For one thing, the bucket is made of wood and does not rust. For another thing, the water is pristine. I make sure of that. No, Nellie, I tell you that is blood and something or someone is down there. I circled the well and returned to Kate. Someone? You are suggesting that a stranger could just wander onto your property and dump a body down there? No, I have excellent security. Cameras and alarm systems. And, as you can see, a natural barrier out back. Beyond the wall is a very steep and rocky hill leading down to the beach. No one would be foolish enough to try it. Besides, I have security installed over there as well. I've asked quickly to review the feeds. He knows all about that sort of thing. Hmm, Quigley had many talents, it seemed. Okay, what now? Do you want me to call the cops? Kate's green eyes blazed, and her pale face turned a bright red. Are you mad, Nellie? Of course not. It's bad enough that you have to deal with the authorities at all. How did she know that? As if reading my mind, Kate said, of course I know about your furtive meetings with that detective, Miss Nagasaki. Nakamura. Whatever. We should have kept this to ourselves, Nellie. Not that I owe that bastard anything. That bastard? Milo, of course. You think whatever, or whoever, is in the well is connected to Milo's death? Kate heaved a deep sigh. Well, of course I do. Maybe it's some sort of warning. Warning? What does Milo's murder have to do with you? Kate smiled enigmatically, as she no doubt had done as femme fatale in those B-movies to great effect. But I was getting tired of all the drama. Look, Kate, if you know anything about what happened to Milo, you'd better spill it. You could be next on the list, you know. And then it occurred to me that I could get caught up in the net, too. Maybe sleeping in my car wasn't such a bad idea. Nonsense, Nellie. But we'll have time to chat later on, for our next session. Now, we will find out what Quigley has discovered on the feed and how soon his friend can come by. With that, Kate turned and started walking along the path back to her house. Friend? What friend? Kate stopped and turned to face me, again sighing. Really? Nellie, do try to keep up. Quigley's friend, Freddy. He'll retrieve whatever is down in that well, and we'll take it from there. Are you serious? If there's a body down there, that's a crime scene. You can't... But Kate was moving again, waving me off. No need to fret, Nellie. Freddy is a very resourceful fellow. You'll see. 
quickly found Zip on the security feeds, so that left Freddy, whoever he was. He arrived just as the sun was setting, parked his truck on the circular driveway, and then retrieved a toolbox from the back. Kate and Quigley were there to greet him, while I held back using my journalistic chops to size him up. Speaking of which, Freddy was short, but sinewy with the look of a jockey. It occurred to me that maybe he rode horses at the Del Mar racetrack. At this distance, it was hard to tell his age, so maybe he was retired. They walked up the driveway where I had been tucked away behind a palm tree, observing the scene. Kate bellowed, Nellie, where are you? Get out here. I stepped out, feeling a little foolish. Why was I being so furtive? But there was something about Freddy that was a little off kilter, even from a distance. Vibes. But Kate didn't seem to notice and led the way up the cobblestone path. There you are. Kate halted the troops and introduced me to our guest without giving up his last name. The fading rays of sunlight lit up Freddy's red hair like a wildfire, and his pale blue eyes shone hard and bright. An unsettling combination. I shifted into full babble mode. Pleased to meet you, Freddy. Kate, uh, Dame Cavendish, tells me that you are well informed about wells. I mean, I've heard of chimney sweeps, but not well sweeps, if there is such a thing. Uh, what is it that you do? Kate, Quigley, and Freddie stared at me and then exchanged a look. In unison, they said, plumbing. Ah, of course, plumbing. Septic tanks and subterranean stuff? Freddie stared some more, then said, sure. Kate clapped her hands. Enough chit-chat. It'll be dark soon, so let's get on with this. But Freddie was staring at me. Then he tossed his head, sending Kate and Quigley a silent message. Nellie, why don't you tend to your cats? Kate said, no need for you to waste your time out here. It's the cocktail hour. Off you go. Well, for Prue and Pat, it's more like the catnip hour. But clearly, Freddy didn't want me around. It occurred to me that he was as suspicious of me as I was of him. Interesting. Our antenna were up. I excused myself and strolled over to my place just as my cell phone chirped in my pocket. Inside, I perched on the settee and looked at the screen. Scylla had texted, What's going on? We need to have a plan before deadline tomorrow. The kitties were mewing and circling their food bowls, so I doled out the friskies and filled their water bowls. The litter box would have to wait. I called Scylla and she answered on the first ring. Well, it's about time, Nell. I didn't dare call you because I didn't know what you were up to and I didn't want to interrupt. But then I started to worry and... Scylla babbles too. I'm sworn to secrecy. But we could be getting a big break on the story, depending. I said, depending on what? I can't tell you yet, Syl. But if it's what I think it is, I'll need to convince Kate... Kate? Dame Cavendish? Did she dish? I took a deep breath, wondering what was happening back at the well. Look, Syl, I'll call you as soon as I have something to report, okay? You know I'm in a tough spot, what with my day job and my side gig is Boswell. Then there's that non-disclosure form she made me sign. It's complicated. A few seconds of silence and then, fine. At least we've got the tusk and the cement snowshoes angle. But all we can say is we've got a reliable source. We can't name Wendy. And there's that press conference coming up next week. If we can add another juicy tidbit, we'll be ahead of the pack. Can we do that, Nellie? Maybe. If Freddy did find a body down there, that was a crime scene in police business, non-disclosure form or not. Tam the memoir and Hello Mustang, my new home. Would it come to that? That was intense. 
I was worried when Mitzi Morrison surprised Nellie as she was snooping around upstairs. I'm not so sure the hostess really bought Nellie's cover story. And who stole the glittering treasures waiting to be auctioned? And what did handyman Freddie find down in Kate's wishing well? Nellie and her pals keep digging, but I'm concerned that they may be digging their own graves. Tune in for episode three. So don't forget to subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped. If you don't want to miss a beat, listen now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. Before you go, please take a moment to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Thanks so much. CamCat Unwrapped also offers other CamCat books as podcasts. Also, check out our interviews with authors, editors, and other bookworms and our background episodes where we unwrap exclusive content relating to our books. Tune in again to CamCat Unwrapped, because CamCat Unwrapped is where book lovers meet.